special on Winter 18. Uh, let's introduce everyone. On the end there, we have Tony Craft, the main man behind the uh, Blackburn Warehouse parties, safe to say. Next one, we have Mike Pickering, Acid House pioneer, DJ legend. Then we have Gary Aston, the main man behind Special from Adidas. On my right side, we have Mike Chikuti, also heavily involved in Special and Adidas. And co conspirator with Gabe Guernsey here, the musician who used on the soundtrack for the latest campaign film. And on the end, we have Matt from Dropjaw, which is um, a warehouse party. How would you describe it, Matt? It's a um, uh, community free party scene. Yeah, a sound system. Yeah. Tell us then, Tony, what was your involvement in, in the warehouse parties in Blackburn? It, it'll be vague. <laughs> very vague. <laughs> very there's, a vague. Few, there's a few dark spots. I suppose me and uh, a good friend of mine called Tommy just had an idea uh, to use Blackburn warehouses because they were empty at the time and there were lots of them. And, and basically we knew we could have the, the run of the town because we had good knowledge of where everything was. Uh, we had DJs that wanted to play. We had sound systems that would be fantastic for the night. And we knew we'd had a small following that would follow us basically. And it was Acid House that brought everyone together, wasn't it? Do you remember when you first sort of came across Acid House? Hacienda. Hacienda was the start. It was uh, two o'clock in the morning and you wanted more. It was never enough. At two o'clock when the last tune was played, you left the Hacienda with a yearning for more. You drove back to Blackburn. And as driving back to Blackburn, going past everywhere else that you saw, you began to think, I think we could use these. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what people don't, don't realise now, isn't it? That everything finished at two. Two o'clock. And right. you were just getting going, really. And as a DJ, you, you're kind of responsible for bringing Acid House to, to this country, aren't you, really? You're one of the, the pioneers, sure. Well, it was like, a, it was like a, a change that happened over a few years, because there was stuff coming out of New York and Chicago, like in 85, 86, that was starting to use four to the floor, you know, uh, like Dar Braxton and some of the things Arthur Baker did, and then... You had people in Chicago doing it, JM Silk and all those kind of people, Steve Hurley. So we were already playing, I was already playing all that on a Friday night and it was really creeping in more and more and I loved it. And, um, but it was kind of mainly vocal stuff at that time, but with that kind of, you know, acidy backing and four to the floor. And when did you become aware of things happening up here? Because we're in Blackburn, we're shooting this in Blackburn for a reason. And it's because of those parties. Well, we used, to, we used to come after the Hacienda, and I, I can never remember the names of all the places I was just talking to these two, but there was the one that was regular for a short time till the police stopped it. I can't remember where that was. And uh, uh, there was, it was always, you always gravitated towards this part, part of Lancashire, seemed to be. And, uh, and then we actually had a club, Hacienda Blackburn. And then it got bigger and bigger, and then it was uh, like Living the Joy, and all, was it Living the Living Dream? Living Live the, the Dream, dream yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Tell us about a bit about Drop Joe Sound System. Matt. How, uh, did it, how did it get started? What was the motivation? It was a massive gamble for me joining it because I started off with just my own turntables that I bought purely for listening to records and that was it. I never intended to DJ or anything. It was just I liked them tunes to want it. And then I got a few speakers off a few friends for really cheap and I got my own little thing at home. Got been talking to Kieran from Drop Jaw trying to learn things and do it, and then one day uh, on Facebook I just said, "Has anyone got any subs for sale?" And he said, "Look, you know, if you're interested, put money with us and we'll get this together, and you can come work with us, and from that we'll learn together and go from there." And as well as doing the free parties, you do um, like licensed venues as well, don't you? How do those two compare? Nothing compares to a free party. I'm sure you all agree. Like there's. It's probably the cheapest equipment going compared to in a club. It's the most expensive, but the vibe, like you're saying you don't care, you, and there's not as much pressure and expectation. You know, you could mess up mixing, but as long as you just sort out quick, whack another tune on, that crowd don't care as long as the music's on and they still got something to party to and they're enjoying it. So tell us about music. How did you get involved with the soundtrack for this game? Um, you won it, Mark. Yeah, let, let's let's just. Clear this up just so. Isn't it? <laughs> um, so, long story short, so the spring summer film, um, for whatever reason, there was a scenario developed. Because, as you know, I, I've known Gary for a long time and yeah. you know, I've, I've worked 
with Gary at Adidas and stuff, but the scenario develops where Gary had the spring summer film, which looked great, but it didn't have a soundtrack. Now, you know, as what everyone else said, you know, kind of growing up and going to the parties and going to the Hacienda and things like that. I was 16 in 1988, you know, so it was kind of like, and, and, you know, it was a very impressionable you know, pres impressionable age and um, Still but I, yeah, but I, <laughs> I absolutely loved it. I mean, I literally, you know, I think the first time that I was lucky enough to get in, so that was the first thing being a 16 year old kid was to get in there and I managed to blag my way in. Um, but as soon as I pushed those things, th those kind of whatever they call it, yeah, open, I knew that my life was not going to be the same ever again, you know, and, and, and it was really that impactful on me. And as, as a consequence, you know, I'd started messing around about two and a half years ago with, you know, bits of cheap equipment and drum machines and things, just just because I wanted to see what it was like. And so for spring, summer this year, there was a scenario developed where they had the film, but there was no soundtrack. And I'd been joking with Gary saying, you know, you're not acid music, you come to me. Whereas, you know, I'm, I'm not the musician, Gabe's the musician, but I'm, I'm messing about, yeah? So I'm saying to Gary, joking as he's filming it and going through beta, listen, I'm the one who should be doing the, the music for this film, and he's kind of, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> but anyway, there's a, a scenario developed where they didn't have any music, so I thought, this is, you know, we're talking about, this is me time. So I played Gary a couple of things, and, and we both felt that this one track, which at the, at the time was just called Acid 03, because it was the third version of my attempts at making something that sounded a bit Chicago or Detroit or whatever, and um, Gary went, it sounds great. And he said, but you know, you, I, I, you know, we need to put it on a film, you know. And Gabe had just scored Metropolis, which is, you know, no mean feat. So I said, well, we know Gabe and he's just done something with Metropolis and Factory Floor and all this kind of stuff. Let's get on to Gabe. Yeah. Your solo stuff's got quite an acidy sort of vibe, hasn't yeah, it? So totally, where's yeah. that come from? Uh, Mike is sending me uh, YouTube <laughs> clips of all his favourite tunes. <laughs> that Mike used to play yeah, at parties yeah. that Tony yeah. used to put on, that Gary and I went to. So that's it, it's literally, it's, it's kind of, you've inspired like pass pass, this guy yeah. to do yeah, raves, yeah, and totally. the music's inspired him to make music. Yeah, it's definitely had a massive influence on, I mean, it still has from like, uh, artists today, like Dan Avery, Errol Alka, and everyone, it's kind of, I mean, there was a point at like, 2008-ish, where it really started coming back. We started, we got in an old um, 303 in the factory floor, and it was live drums, 303, and some vocals, and that was it. Just, it was that going through a bass amp with drums, but just taking it back to that simplicity of yeah. kick, 303. I don't but know, then it's you've got, got people about. like, you know, like Richard H. Kirk from Cabaret Voltaire yeah. and New Order and Nine Inch Nails and people who really appreciate, you know, who almost made that music that influences what yeah. you do, appreciate where you are taking that yeah, influence. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's about getting that, getting that initial influence and then pushing it just a little bit further or, you know, in a different direction. It's kind of, yeah, okay. you know, almost rehashing it in a way and kind of, I mean, it's great. I mean, you always kind of end up going back to that acid squelchy sound no matter how hard you try going somewhere else on it do you know what i mean so it's kind of it's kind of timeless isn't it or, or futuristic yeah. it still sounds there's some i think future, people really connect with that tone of synth i know it's like you know it's quite weird we we were doing that in the studio and we were just going back to that yeah i acid think squelch, i think know, the thing like, is as well you know and you know mike could tell you about this more than I, you know, more qualified to talk about it. But, you know, this, the, the term acid house didn't exist at the beginning. You know, again, that was something that was kind of a label that was put on, but it was that, that acid sound. It wasn't a night of records that had that sound in it. You know, it was a night of lots of different influences and, you know, it was like a melting pot. Yeah, that was a big part of it. And I think in fairness, you know, Mike did bring that part to it, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, regardless of what they say down south, Mike brought that part to it, I, I would say. I mean, Gary's always said to me, you know, if you were young around that time and you weren't going to those parties, you know, what were you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, what you'd be what? kicking yourself now. Yeah, yeah. yeah what, what were you doing, <laughs> yeah, seriously? I can never wear that out. When you yeah, meet yeah. people your own age, you're like, well, did yeah. you go to the Hacienda? I, was in I, mean, that. I mean, when they did the music, this, my brief was, I want that squelchy yeah, that's acid what sound. Was... That, it's got to be that acid sound. You know, when Mike was talking earlier about 
going to spinning. You know, I I grew up with spinning when it was opposite the Royal Exchange yeah, before that's it moved. It. That's what that's and, what I was meaning, And yeah. we were all into you know b-boying and electro, and you know spinning was the place in the northwest where you could get electro import. So all that Arthur Baker stuff and Soul Sonic Force and you know and and I didn't realise you know because we were into that and a lot of the sort of football lads from Blackburn were obsessed with New Order. And it was only when I got older I sort of joined the dots that actually New Order were actually listening to the stuff that me and my mates who were into hip hop were listening to. Yeah, it's like Stu Allen and Rebecca this. Like, well, it all oh, came from yeah. craft work, really. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and, and so we, and, you know, but, but that, that where sound. Where New Order loved, you know. Yeah, that sound, that, that, that acid sound to me was almost like a. I don't know. It was it was like the next chapter of electro for me. And, Absolutely. And, you know, and, well, and electronic instruments were were new, or fairly new. They were new that the consumer at home could start using them. So it was a whole new, beautiful world, really. What clothes do you remember from the day? All sorts of stuff. You know, like um, hooded sweatshirts, kind of baggy carpenter jeans, you know, Adidas running shoes. And I remember there was a change in how people were dancing, you know, there's that, you know, that kind of iconic acid dance. And then it changed, but also there was a change in how people were dressing out and how they had their hair, you know. I remember it was like running shoes and, and, and hooded tops. And then, you know, it was kind of everyone, you know, and long hair and bobs, you know. And then people started having like kind of wedge haircuts again and wearing kickers and, you know, like blouse on style jackets and polo you know, shirts. And it was also, a, it was also I always thought, football, like too. a secret society quite a long time because the authorities didn't know what was going on. No, it took so a while. It was like, I, sp I suppose um, Northern Soul when you saw people on the trains on a Saturday, early Saturday night with just like the badges and, and the bags going to Wigan or Blackpool Mecca and all that, they all knew each other but no one else knew what they were doing and there's something quite magical about that I think. Yeah, and that's where clothing plays quite a big part yeah. in it because without saying something you can just read what someone's wearing and think, yeah, I'll probably see him Saturday night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I've always tried to do with Spezial. I've always, you know, I like the idea of it being a, a mass-produced secret, you know, where people, people kind of who, who, who know that part of Adidas know that it, it represents a particular mindset and a particular attitude, you know. I'd, you know, I don't want to do tourism pieces for Spezial, it's got to sort of, it's got to feel legit, it's got to feel authentic, it's got to have some legitimate connection to it and, uh, and, and you know, and also it can be something where you can turn people onto stuff that they might not know about or might not necessarily be aware of, you know, and so I think it's really important to do stuff that's, that's, that's modern, I'm not trying to be futuristic and, and I'm not, I'm certainly not turning me back on the past, but I like to glance at the past rather than stare at it, if you know what I mean. And how has Blackburn translated into the actual collection? <clears throat> Are there any key pieces in that? You know, I work with a, a, a guy called Gary Watson, who's also from this area, who I grew up with. And, you know, Gary was one of them guys who was a little bit older than me, who used to go on shopping trips to Switzerland when he was younger. So with the with the graphic identity, we looked at a lot of the Adidas products from that period and looked at some of the graphics and sort of adopted those graphics into graphics that would reflect this subculture that is kind of permeates the range. So, you know, on the back of the, the long sleeve T-shirt, you know, long sleeve tees were like almost standard issue in the late 80s. We've got the graphic on the back there, which is kind of like a warehouse graphic, which is like a, you know, in the summer collection, it was like a Balearic scene. This time it's kind of like sound system warehouse scene and just incorporating little things into the graphics, which are just nods to that period, you know, parties for the people, by the people. And, and um, I used the set end on one of the t-shirts and that's, set end was, uh, it was originally, it, it was a strip club, wasn't it? Yeah, Sundays, yeah. I believe. Was it? Or? No, it was. It was. It was. It was a. It was a proper sticky carpet yeah, club, was, yeah. wasn't it? Do you yeah, know it what I mean? Yeah. It was, and, and it was, um, and 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 the set end was the, the the club in Blackburn that embraced acid house, and we 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 affectionately named it the the sweat end, 
and it uh, eventually lost its license as a result of putting on the Acid House night. So they, they, were sat, they were just Saturday at first, weren't it? And then it went to Saturday and Fridays. Yeah, it was, yeah. Because it was so popular. And that was the meeting point for the convoys were the, uh, that would go to the warehouse. Kind of the nucleus for the... Yeah, so there was a, a, an Adidas um, apparel range that I found in one of the old catalogues called Take Off. And it had this very kind of 80s graphic. And so I thought, well, we could take that and adopt it. And put set end into it. So there are little kind of nods to, to, to an era and to something that I was um, personally involved in and have massive affection for, I guess.